Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, we can all deny watching it, but uh, a multi-billion dollar industry tends to say otherwise. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to assume that you do, because you're listening right now. Uh, you can subscribe to the podcast. Give it, Hit that old subscribe button. Give us the five-star rating, uh, basically wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. Basically, it's all good. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In the Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Also, uh, do not hesitate to check us out on social media. You can find us on the Facebook, the Twitter, and the Instagram at where else? At In the Seats for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I say this a lot, but it's true, it's the most important. Please pay us a visit over at In the Seats. In the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large. Because if we like to uh, watch it and write about it and talk about it, we love it when you come by uh, and read about it and listen about it. So please pay us a visit. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. You know, we're all about cinema here at In the Seats, and that goes for anything cinematic and really. We apply that to all its forms, and there is the 50th anniversary of an iconic film coming up uh, today, actually, it, well, tomorrow, specifically, but uh, that you would not necessarily expect. Um, believe it or not, it is the 50th anniversary of Deep Throat. Yeah, boys and girls, I'm talking about that Deep Throat. It's, uh, it's, it's really an iconic piece of... Uh, pop culture uh, relevance and sort of importance and because it, it changed so many things in regards to adult entertainment and just understanding, uh, I guess, how, uh, how these things go on. And it, it, it really broke down so many barriers when it comes to... Uh, uh, having adult entertainment or hardcore sex depicted on uh, on the big screen. It's, uh, in case you don't know, it is the story of a young woman, uh, Linda Lovelace, playing herself. She's uh, unsatisfied and unfulfilled because she gets so little pleasure from sex. She feels lots of little tingles, but, you know, she wants bells ringing, she wants dams bursting and bombs going off. I mean, who doesn't, really? Uh, her roommate uh, sends her to an unconventional therapist, who, who discovers the root of her problem. Uh, her clitoris is deep down in her throat, as opposed to where it's supposed to be. And the solution uh, is the technique known as, you guessed it, deep throat. Uh, once she's cured, she devotes herself to, to helping others find sexual satisfaction that she so desired. This is... It's comedy, but it's it was intended to be comedy. It, it was intended to, to, to make light of something that... Well, historically, we've taken incredibly seriously and still do. And believe it or not, uh, this film, which was made for a, a scant $25,000 back in the day, uh, has been reported to have made well over $600 million. And it was the birth of, I guess, Porno Chic, which, uh, which really was the first thing that allowed this kind of material to meet to, to get to mainstream audiences because before it was in back rooms, it was underground film, it was it was all very different. This was a a moment in the cultural zeitgeist where there really was a shift. I mean, obviously, uh, it wasn't all positive because, you know, conservative Christian groups, uh, anti-porn feminists were looking to ban the film, but and it was prosecuted on, on so many different levels. And, I mean, it even became a piece of uh, pop culture history as the Watergate scandal, uh, uh, Deep Throat lent its name to the Watergate scandal in a very unintentional way, obviously. But uh, it's, it's a piece of history. It is definitely a piece of cinematic history, and it's one of those things that deserves uh, to be preserved. And that's part of the why we got to talk to them, because they are working on... Uh, 
the preservation of the of this iconic film as well and uh they're launching uh an entire world tour of uh of the film and uh they're launching off this week in new york with uh a lot of special events there's going to be a screening at the roxy uh tomorrow of the original 16 millimeter with a panel discussion and historians and with a sneak peek of the restored version as well and then uh on the 12th there's going to be uh screenings of the 4k restored version as well as the burlesque show and it's in the slipper room in new york and it's gonna be a fun another fun event and during the month of june uh the Muse- museum of sex uh gonna have a month-long run of their uh porno chic to sex positivity exhibit which this is a really big part of as well there'll be memorabilia from the film and all that if you want to go check that out near in the new york area but uh we had the unique pleasure of sitting down with uh not the filmmaker who is uh gerard damiano senior we get to talk to gerard damiano jr uh and his uh sister christar uh to talk about sort of the history of the film and along with them we talked with robin leonardi uh who, who obviously is very involved as well in this project but also she's the daughter of legendary porn star and activist gloria leonard it's uh we had a really long and interesting talk and it's it's again it's an amazing thing as we got to watch this and see this all unfold because this is a piece of cinema history and as we've said before cinema deserves to be preserved and it's a it's an important thing and we had a great talk with them and we learned more about uh their efforts to to get this film mentioned in the national registry and preserved and really you know maintained like again it it should be preserved because it's not you know you can disagree with the content but you can't argue with the cultural impact of the film for better or for worse but you know please you know please uh enjoy our talk here with an open mind because it was real interesting one and we really got down to the the nitty-gritty of of why this was such a a pivot point in the in the pop culture zeitgeist and why uh this film deserves to be restored and how it was restored and hopefully you know others like it will still be restored as well we had a great talk so i definitely hope you enjoy it and uh like i said if you're if you're interested you know go check out these events that are happening in new york or uh keep your eyes open for the upcoming world tour as uh as the restored deep throat might be coming to a town near you but uh First, let's sit back and enjoy our conversation with uh, this team behind the restoration of this classic film, because between you and me, it's a good one. All right. Well, I mean, obviously, first off, just thank you, everybody, for the time today. I really appreciate this. Hi, Dave. Good morning. Thank you, Dave. Now, I mean, I guess my first question is because, I mean, I love the fact that this was restored. and I mean, I fully believe in restoring film and preserving film. I mean, it is such an important thing, but I'm curious walk me through maybe sort of the the beginning steps of 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 you both going okay maybe we need to restore this maybe the elements are starting to degrade maybe it's time we do a proper restoration of of what is really a classic piece of cinema i'm gonna jump in okay Um, this is not something that just happened overnight deep throat is something that has kind of loomed large in our lives and kind of loomed over us you know since we were kids so the idea of um of restoring it you know, was always in the back of our minds, how to go about doing it was the tricky thing, because we didn't have any of the actual elements of the film. It's been um, altered over the years in different versions. And, um, you know, I've I've been for years looking for um, prints, film elements, you know, uh, pre-print elements, preferably. And it's been a very, you know, difficult journey. Um, We came up with a couple of 35 millimeter prints um, that were okay, but not perfect. Um, We partnered with uh, Cineric, who's a a world-class film restoration laboratory. 
And so they've been helping us and they, you know, assured us that, um, you know, we could restore from what we had, but, you know, it would be a very long, you know, uh, a painstaking process to try to clean up all the scratches and, and so forth from our, you know, grindhouse prints. And there was no guarantee of the quality. Um, so finally, the um, Eye Museum in Amsterdam stepped forward and they had um, an internegative that uh, they loaned us for us to uh, base our restoration on. And so we're, you know, we're very, we're very proud and very, you know, relieved <laughs> that, you know, right up, right down to the wire. I mean, they're still, it's still at the lab, they're still working on it, but we have a few more days before the actual 50th anniversary in which we would like to uh, premiere the 4K restoration. For sure. No, and I mean, I like, I will make a full disclosure. I had never actually seen the film until just oh. recently. I was, it was the first time viewing. But okay. I mean, I'm kind of curious. And I mean, specifically Robin, but I mean, obviously all of you, please jump in on this one. I was struck by the humor. And I mean, I'm kind of curious at the moment, at the time when the film came out, I mean, is is that what the impetus was for why it was so popular and, and such a hit? Because I mean, at least for me as a viewer, that's what caught me off guard the most, I would say. I think there were a lot of reasons why it rose to popularity, you know, uh, not, not nearly enough to include, of course, um, the notoriety around it. But I think at the time that the film was made, um, it was kind of tongue in cheek and, and it was, and it made light of sex. It wasn't a heavy, you know, serious thing. And I think for the time, it really kind of epitomized um, uh, the, just that, that uh, barrier there uh, where uh, the uh, women's liberation movement had just kind of come together and women were burning bras and, you know, there was just this sense of freedom, sexual freedom. And uh, I think the film kind of, you know, takes that a little bit and, and it's definitely tongue in cheek. Uh, and I think that uh, Gerard Sr. intended it to be that way. I, I mean, I can't, I, I'll, I'll never know for sure. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I too had not seen it in its entirety in a very long time, if ever. I mean, you know, I've seen the snippets and everyone knows about it and everyone's heard about it, but really how many people have actually seen it? And so when I watched it in its entirety, I was really taken with um, the pacing of the film, uh, like you say, the, you know, the, uh, the, the comedic slant to it, uh, just everything about it, I found to be really quite um, innocent and charming. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to interject on that and say that was so much of our dad, his personality, he was so, so funny like almost to the like humbling funny that he didn't even realize, I think how funny he was. Oh, he realized. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that line, do you mind if I smoke while you eat? I mean, that's, that will forever go down in the annals of, of you know, cinematic comedic history. Well, Deep Throat was very, very consciously a comedy. There's no doubt about that. All the laughs are intentional, at least, you know, the, my father had hoped the laughs were intentional. Um, you know, we we look at the movie now and we consider it dad humor. <laughs> OK, now, when we were kids, you know, that wasn't even a term. There wasn't even a concept for dad humor. We just thought that was our dad. We didn't realize all dads were supposed to be like that. But he had a very corny sense of humor and he definitely brought that to deep throat. Um, uh, our father aspired to, you know, make much more serious films, but um you know, I don't think he ever could have made Devil and Miss Jones or Story of Joanna without Deep Throat first, because it came at a time where laws were just changing and um, hardcore sex was only just available, you know, on screen. And even so, the laws were not clear. Deep Throat was busted. Everyone was arrested. It was busted again and then busted across America. And so the idea of seeing hardcore sex in a communal setting was relatively new. And so, you know, our father later, you know, said, and other people have also, you know, agreed that it was at the right place at the right time. And that comedic approach, the lightheartedness um, made it very accessible to a lot of people who weren't ready for, you know, 
uh, deep uh, ruminations on sex and sexuality and life and death along with the hardcore pornography. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Deep Throat was kind of an entry level film, which then kind of kicked the door down and allowed for not only our father, but other filmmakers to step forward and start making more ambitious films that involve sex. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really a love story. You know, it's it's her not wanting to fuck around and find someone that she can settle down with. And, um, you know, the fact that it's so female centric and that it opens up with a woman being pleasured and it's all about you know, the, the female's quest and desire for fulfillment. Um, I think there are just so many uh, things uh, around the film that were groundbreaking that people had never really seen before. Well, and I mean, so much of this film really is in the audio. I mean, not just from the dialogue. I mean, especially at the end when he says, oh, don't worry, the doc says he can take a few inches off. I mean, that's just <laughs> such a perfect line. <laughs> but I mean, to me, it's the soundtrack as well. And I mean, I'm well, like, I'm kind of curious when you're reassembling the elements and putting it together, are there any kind of clearance issues you guys have to go through? Or is yeah, it just well, a question of just finding the best quality of, you know, of everything, really? Well, our, our father was very interested in music and took great care in all of his films in choosing the, the right music and whenever possible composing music. So there's actually a number of uh, original compositions in the film. Uh, our father wrote the Deep Throat theme, you know, the, the, um, the lyrics to that and the other, you know, little original songs that are in there. There were some, um, some well-known songs. Um, the uh, Love is Strange, for example, mm -hmm was a very popular song recorded by many artists, but they did um, an original recording of that song, you know, uh, did uh, license the composition and then recorded the music um, for the film. And so uh, otherwise there was uh, library music that my father made all the selections, you know, licensed it for use in the film and so forth. Um, so he was definitely hands-on in the soundtrack. He chose every one of those cuts or needle drops um, that you hear in the soundtrack, as well as, you know, was very involved in the original music as well. And I think Gerard is planning to uh, release a compilation or a best of. We're, well, we're of working on, on uh, putting together not just some of the music from Deep Throat, but there's other music that appeared in different films that um, is noteworthy, you know, in its own right. My father, you know, w worked with a number of composers who then went on to get, you um, you know, a lot of notoriety, you know, he worked in early on with uh, Rupert Holmes, who's uh, best known for the, uh, the Pina Colada song, okay. <laughs> you know, Alan B. Silvestri, who's better known for um, uh, making soundtracks for Steven Spielberg. Um, but some of his music is found in, in, uh, in our father's film. So, you know, we're interested, but, you know, as you mentioned, you know, clearance, music rights is a very, very difficult and tricky subject. So, you know, we're trying to do the right thing. And so we're trying to sort out all the rights and, you know, trying to put together a collection of the songs that people can share and, and enjoy. And I mean, I think this is something where the artistry of this film really comes in because you can, you can just listen to this film, but you can see it in your head. It's, you don't <laughs> necessarily, like the sex aside, like you can understand the entire film and, and know what's going on just but, by listening to it. But you know, that, that would have saved our father a lot of legal issues had people just listened to it and not gone to see it. We wouldn't have ended up in, in court. But I mean, I guess that kind of dovetails into my next question because I mean, I'm kind of curious. I mean, obviously at the initial release, all the legal problems and everything that came up, but this film became such a, 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 a significant moment in sort of the pop culture zeitgeist at the time. I mean, in, in your house at the time, like, what was the reaction to sort of Deep Throat, not just being successful, but being that successful? You know, one misconception about, about our family is that, you know, our father was a hairdresser by day and he snuck out at night and made porn movies. But that was not true. We were very aware that he was a filmmaker, even though we were little kids. We were proud of that because he was proud of that. He was very passionate about film and filmmaking. So we were always um, aware. We were often on the set. 
we were never um, subjected to hardcore pornography as children, you know, nothing like that. But when, you know, our father was going out location scouting or on location or shooting dialogue scenes, he would love to have us there. And we shared that, um, you know, that wonder of the magic of making movies, you know, um, all of the close friends of our, our parents were involved in the, you know, what was then known as the underground film you know, seeing this was before independent films, as they're now called. Um, if you weren't working with the, you know, in the Hollywood system, you were an underground mm -hmm. filmmaker. So, you know, in New York City, that's how movies were were made. So, you know, we had, you know, crew members in and out of our house all day. Our mother would be typing, you know, their scripts up because she had gone to, uh, to secretarial school. So she was a really good typist. So everybody, you know, had her typing their scripts. So when Deep Throat came out, we were actually, you know, went to Miami. We were on the set. So we knew all the crew. You know, we met Linda and Chuck and like that. So we were very aware of the movie. Now, when it came out, no one was prepared for the success, the controversy, the, the prosecution, the persecution. And so that's what affected us more rather than the subject matter of the film is that, you know, we as kids were very in tune to our father's anxiety. You know, he was, you know, dogged by the feds. He was, you know, uh, connected now with the mob. He didn't even know when he got into production on Deep Throat who he was working with. But by the time it, it started making all that money, he certainly did. And these were the things that um, kept him up at night. And this kind of spilled over to us. So we were aware of that. You know, he had to leave and go to go to court cr halfway across the country or all the way. He went to, you know, Arizona to be on trial. He was in Memphis, Tennessee, you know, Kentucky. And so, you know, daddy would have to go away, you know, for a while. And, you know, and our mother was, you know, did the best she could to, you know, um, not keep it all from us, but help us to understand what was going on that, you know, our father was ahead of his time, that um, he was not a criminal. People just didn't understand. They weren't ready for his films. These were the kind of things that, um, you know, our, our mother, told us to kind of prepare us for, you know, seeing our father on the news, you know, seeing him in the newspapers, you know, and not always in a favorable light. No, I mean, I'm curious from from all of your perspectives, because I mean, I love that you bring up just sort of the, the legalities behind it and just sort of who, you know, in reality, he was, in, you know, your father was, had to be in business with and just at the time, because that was the nature, especially of, of adult filmmaking. But I'm kind of curious for all of you, Given those elements and just sort of the, the sex positive uh, nature of the film, how important was Deep Throat in sort of legitimizing adult entertainment? Well, if, if I, <laughs> okay. I don't mean to, I don't want to monopolize this uh, this podcast, but you know, I think I can I can answer that. You know, one of the 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 most significant things about Deep Throat was it was the first movie to cross over into the mainstream. Now, Behind the Green Door was, you know, right on its, its, um, its heels. Um, these films are, are mentioned often together. Um, Behind the Green Door, of course, being the Mitchell Brothers film that was made in San Francisco. So it was kind of a simultaneous revolution happening on the East Coast and on the West Coast. And when Deep Throat became popular, suddenly um, it was all over the news, but people started going to adult theaters. And when I say people, what I really mean is women. <laughs> and couples, because prior to that, you know, if you went to a porn theater on 42nd Street, you know, it was all men. It was what, you know, my father would refer to as the raincoat crowd, you know, or guys would go in there and have newspapers on their lap. And, you know, if you went in the theater, you would just hear newspapers rustling for, uh, for you know, two hours or what have you. So um, when Deep Throat came out, suddenly, Couples were going on dates to see it. As I said, women went in unprecedented numbers to see an adult film in adult theaters, and it became the in thing to do. So, you know, that was unprecedented at the time. Prior to that, you know, porn, you know, as, as we, you know, as we know, it's smut films were either loops that you saw on a peep show where you put a quarter in and you got a little bit of it and you put another quarter in to see a little bit more and if you put enough quarters in you'd start seeing the same thing over and over because it was all on a loop um, otherwise there were stag films that you know you might see at a bachelor party or in the basement of the you know knights of columbus hall or whatever but um, otherwise it wasn't really accessible to you know mainstream audiences until deep throat 
Now, I mean, I'm curious. I mean, just to to sort of dive into that a little bit more, and I mean, I've got to ask the ladies this question because it really does feel like this film was a a linchpin moment that either feminists either loved it or they hated it. Why was this film in particular such a a a dividing line? Because I mean, there's no one who's sort of in between when it comes to sort of deep throat or even sort of adult entertainment in general. But this film really feels like it was sort of the breaking point. That, you can, that women are allowed to love adult entertainment. Well, it was the first time I think that it opened up the dialogue about what women really wanted and how to pleasure them. And, and sex was also for them and not just for the man. So I think that was very groundbreaking to begin with. And then after that, there were women who were then interested in seeing and uh, you know being a part of adult films and watching them. Yes, I think it gave women permission to... Um, uh, ask for what they needed in bed and to express their desires and you know, their displeasure at, or their frustration at a lack thereof. Um, it validated uh, just, you, you know, the, the concept of women's empowerment, truly. Uh, it, it, it created a, a safe place for, for women to express their sexuality without fear of being uh, criticized or demoralized. So I think in that way, it really was quite groundbreaking um, because of those points. No, and I, I would definitely agree with you on that. And I mean, it's as much as it's complicated because obviously Linda had a complicated history with sort of the film and sort of her involvement with it and the history behind it. What was it about Linda that uh, Gerard Sr., found to be because she really was this sort of very sort of iconic and very sort of beautiful but also a little naive at the same time about sort of the world and she really did fit this sort of really interesting character uh, of a woman trying to find herself I mean what was it about Linda that your dad uh, really found compelling as a star to put on the screen um well I'm going to jump in and, and speak um for my father as best I can, because we were all very close and he talked about this a lot. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're pretty clear about that, that, you know, Deep Throat was written for Linda. And I don't even say Linda Lovelace because when he met her, she was Linda Trainer. He gave her the name Linda Lovelace. Um, what really struck him about her was, as you said, this innocence, this um, innocent quality about her that was paired with this this outrageous sexual technique and this very open sexuality, which um, he found very, you know, uh, not only refreshing, I would say, but it was it was almost revolutionary at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, when he brought his uh, his script to, um, you know, his partners, the backers, they didn't buy it. They said, no, she's, you know, she's got no tits, okay, is what they said, because in their mind, <laughs> she didn't fit this idea of what a sex symbol was or a porn star would be. You know, they're thinking big, you know, busty, blonde hair, you know, these stereotypes of what a woman should, a woman should be. Um, where on the other hand, my father found that, um, that she was, and I quote, the girl next door. She had this quality of being a real person, someone that you could know. And that he felt was a lot more um, erotic than this fantasy of, of this untouchable, unapproachable, unreal woman, you know, the ideal porn star, whatever that is. And so the film was really built around that. And um, Linda, although, again, she had this, you know, incredible sexual technique, she had no acting experience whatsoever. So my father worked very close with her for weeks before they went to Miami to shoot to give her a little training just to understand some of the concepts of of being in character and staying in character and improvisation and projecting and just, you know, finding the light you know, on the set and all these things that she had no idea of just to kind of, you know, um, give her a little framework to work within. But a lot of what you see on the screen is really authentically her. He was trying to create a vehicle to allow her to be herself. You know, she wasn't playing Lady Macbeth. She was really being Linda. And that's why, you know, kind of ironically, for better or worse, 
Our father created the name Linda Lovelace. In the film, she appears, you know, Linda Lovelace as herself. You know, of course, right. that wasn't her name. Later, she's always referred to as Linda Lovelace. And, you know, when, when she talked about the film, you know, years later, you know, she talked about Linda Lovelace as if it is Linda was a different person from herself. You know, that was a character that was created. It wasn't really her. And no, that was I mean, a distinction. For sure, for sure. No, but I mean, something else I appreciated about it, and I mean, just going back to just sort of the 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 pro-feminist uh, sort of angle on it, and also sort of the sex-positive angle on it, is that, and I mean, this is a quote from the notes, but I mean, something your dad said, I don't remember the line exactly, but just how there is a limited cin cinematography when it comes to sex. Like, there's only a couple of ways you can sort of really shoot it and do it. <laughs> and I mean, it, it, the film felt more honest. I mean, how did sort of that shooting style do you think contributed to sort of the 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 sex positive legacy that this film has because it's not sort of perfectly lit and overly dramatized it just it just feels like people are screwing and they are and that's, <laughs> that's kind of the way it is you know <laughs> well well i want to just speak to that to say you know our father would be the first to tell you it's not a very good film and by that he was a little embarrassed by it and not about the sex the content about the quality they they were very young crew they were doing the best they had they had a very low budget which for you know a sex film at the time you know twenty five thousand dollars was a lot of money but since most of that went to film and processing um there wasn't really much left over and so you know a lot of the the stuff that they were doing they were just learning on the set so when my father looked at the film years later he just saw all the mistakes you know, the, the shots were unexposed, the exteriors, the sound quality is bad, you know, the, you know, and as I've been going through the restoration, you know, there's a fine line where I'm trying to fix his mistakes, but then you got to stop because then it's not a restoration, you know, it's right. remastering. So, you know, I'm trying to not go cross that line. Okay. I just want the sound to be, to be audible. <laughs> okay. That you can hear what they're, they're saying. And so there was that, that kind of thing. So they were really, you know, my father would say, we did the best we could with what we had, you know, they had no idea of the success, you know, but after that, they were able to get bigger budgets, and then make better movies, and they all had more, a little more skill. So, you know, a lot of the, you know, the matter of fact way that things are shown, that was just, that's what they had, and there it is, you know, it's all the artifice that costs money. The reality is cheap. <laughs> no, but you're right. It's the, the reality is cheap. But I mean, it's just it's sort of the nature of life. And I mean, that's, again, part of the magic of it, because I mean, like you said, I mean, he was honest. It wasn't necessarily a good film, but there is still a lot of truth to it at the same time, which I found really compelling. And I mean, I love the fact just to sort of dovetail back onto the anniversary and just sort of the vote throat hashtag that you guys have going on. Can you talk a little bit about not just wanting to get this film preserved and put into the archives where it, where in my opinion it belongs but i would say the necessity for i, I would guess to open up uh, these archives to maybe in the more independent film and even more alternative film like obviously this film was well since i've been kind of spearheading that again i don't want to monopolize the conversation but i feel that you know i'm in the best position to talk about the um the vote throat campaign and if you go to the National Film Registry homepage and read their mission statement, they really clearly state that they're representing all manner of American filmmaking, not just big budget Hollywood films. And if you read that whole paragraph that they wrote, it basically says Deep Throat needs to be in the National Film Registry. It says, you know, the prerequisites for the, it's got to be 10 years old or older. It has to have some kind of historical or cultural significance. Now, few films could claim the kind of significance that Deep Throat had culturally and historically. So, you know, again, whether or not it's a great film, we'll leave that up to the critics. But should it be in the National Film Registry? Absolutely. I mean, you know, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein is one of the films preserved. So I think they can make a little room for Deep Throat because as far as we know, not a single X-rated film has been accepted into the, the film registry. So Gerard, how can we tell David's listeners how to vote Throat? Uh, go to DamianoFilms.com, right on the bottom <laughs> of the homepage, there's a link, you click on it. Now, any US citizen is, um, is able to vote 
Um, the, the selections are made based on um, just vote votes. There's not a panel of judges or anything. It's just anybody can vote. You can vote for up to 50 films, 25 of which are selected every year for preservation. Um, so, you know, we feel that it, the film absolutely should, should be in the film registry, but in order to do so, they need to hear it not just from me and my sister and Robin, they need to hear it from everybody. So we're encouraging people to, um, to click on the link or just you know Google National Film Registry and you'll go right there and vote for Deep Throat. Now you stole my segue, Robin, but I'll allow it because it was sorry, a good one. No, sorry. no, it was a good one. You did a good job, so it's okay. <laughs> but I mean, there is something I'd, I'd love to specifically ask you just based on sort of the work that you do and the work you have done because uh, you can't say the words deep throat without thinking about Watergate. And I mean, how important was that event and sort of that label using the deep throat title? How important was that to put sort of something that was sex positive and sort of adult, as it were, into sort of the mainstream? Because, again, it's one of those things like as much as like people will say deep throat and not necessarily know that it was a, an adult film. Mm -hmm. They will just reference back to Watergate. Take it away, Gerard. OK. Yeah. Yes. Well, a couple of things, you know, I mentioned that my father, you know, he wasn't very proud of it as a film, although he never, you know, denied the the celebrity that that it gave him that afforded him to make better films to move on. But he was more proud of coming up with the term deep throat. That was an original thing. And he would say, I made it into the dictionary. You know, he was proud of that. He said, <laughs> I made up a new word. You know, how many people can say that, that they made a word that's now being used? So when the Watergate thing happened and then the uh, informant used that term, suddenly Deep Throat now has two meanings. So you could look it up and, you know, there's the whole oral sex, you know, part of it. But then, you know, now it's become synonymous with the whistleblower, with a whistleblower, with an informant. Now, our father was was dogged by um, by Richard Nixon and his administration. And it's something that we've seen happen over and over through history where, you know, people often try to distract from their own wrongdoing by pointing fingers. So he had a very famous, very public anti-porn campaign. And so he targeted our father. There were, you know, later it came out, they spent, you know, thousands and thousands of hours and God knows how many taxpayer dollars having federal agents watching porn movies, writing notes about them, writing. You should read some of these descriptions. I mean, it's hilarious, some of the stuff to have, like agents describing, like they do a synopsis of the whole film and, and try to interpret what they're seeing and, and so forth and, and like that. And, you know, our phones were tapped, our father was tailed, you know, and like this. And so in the end, you know, he was proud to say that Nixon tried to take down Deep Throat, but in the end, it was Deep Throat to take down Nixon. <laughs> that's a great line. <laughs> and that's him. I'm, I can't take credit for it. I'm just trying to, to get it right. <laughs> now, I mean, I'm curious. And again, please, everyone chip in on this. But what is... I mean, we're on the brink of the 50th. There are all these events planned next week. But at the same time, I look at this and it's 50 years later and we still can't, we're still awkward as a society and culturally talking about sex. Why, why do you think it's taken this long, even after sort of this iconic film and this iconic moment where people went, had this sort of light bulb moment? Why, why did the light bulb not sort of stay on? after sort of deep throat hit hit the masses and, and let people talk about sex and sort of deal with sex in a bit more of a, as a matter of fact fashion. Well, I think America has always been, you know, incredibly puritanical and we've seen, you know, a shift where it's even more so now, yeah, I think, yeah. than it's been um, in my lifetime. Uh, and the work that my mother, who was a First Amendment activist and a, a free speech advocate, uh, and Gerard's father, you know, they spent quite a, a bit of their careers uh, fighting censorship, uh, taking it to the Supreme Court and, you know, uh, with the intention of ensuring that our liberties would remain. And, and they're, they're precarious now more so than ever. Uh, and, and it's, you know, it's politically and religiously motivated uh, by those in power with money who lobby, who still feel that they are 
uh, that they can choose uh, what others see and do. And, um, you know, it's a, it's like a Groundhog Day thing. It's like, well, uh, it's, it's the same. We're fighting the same battles, literally, that our parents fought. No, for sure. And I mean, it, it's it's one of those things that, I mean, it makes me a little sad, but I mean, at the same time, I'm glad that you are all working to preserve this piece of history because, I mean, again, it's it's important. And I mean, for me as not just, you know, a cinema fan, but just a fan of, you know, free speech and being able to say what you want, I, this to me is an important thing to preserve. And I mean, I would love, could you guys talk to me a little bit just about sort of the events that are planned sort of around uh, the release next week and what you guys are doing. And I mean, I guess maybe even going forward, just about keeping the spirit of this, this, this film alive, like what, what is the work that you are doing and what can be done even further? Well, I think that's the goal is to keep the spirit of this film alive. And, and our 50th uh, anniversary celebration is to do just that, you know, we want to uh, share the film in the manner in which Gerard senior, uh, uh, filmed it as it was intended to be seen. We want to engage with um, the, the, the newer, the younger generations um, who are curious about it, who have heard about it. Um, and also, uh, you know, Gerard can speak to some of that as well. Uh, but right now we have several events planned. We are rolling out in New York. Uh, we've got our big 4K uh, restoration world premiere red carpet. Uh, at the Slipper Room, where we'll have three showings with go-go dancers and a burlesque show. Um, and tickets are available online at the Slipper Room website. Uh, a couple of days before that, we're doing um, kind of a sneak peek with a 16 millimeter screening at the Roxy Cinema Tribeca, which actually happens to correspond with the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, and for the entire month of June, we will have um, some of uh, 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 Gerard Damiano Sr.'s uh, archives and memorabilia on display at the Museum of Sex. And then we're uh, doing a world tour, and I'll let roll it over to Gerard and, and Chris Starr, and they can tell you more. <laughs> well, thank you, Robin, and, and that was well put. I just want to add that um, in almost all of our screenings, at least the ones that we've planned so far, we have a talkback component that after the film is screened, we have an opportunity for audience members to ask questions. We have a moderated panel. We're bringing in different people, um, historians that can offer um, some uh, uh, context for Deep Throat and explain to you know some younger people what's the big deal. You know they might look at this film now and compare it to what you know any kid can get with three clicks on a smartphone, right. you know, there's more heinous, you know, sex acts, you know, than they could have imagined back in 1972 that Deep Throat is, is rather vanilla. So it takes, um, it takes a little explanation to, you know, for somebody to understand how the world was different back then and why Deep Throat was such a big deal and why forces rose against it and tried to shut it down and so forth. And so that's why what we're doing right now is, um, is more event cinema, is that we're doing a very, you know, small run, uh, select theaters, one night only, or maybe a couple of nights where we have an opportunity to, again, contextualize the film and have an opportunity to talk about it and, and open up that debate again. So we're starting, of course, in New York, as Robin mentioned, because, you know, it even though it's shot in Miami, it's a very New York film and it premiered in New York. And so we feel that it's important that we kick off, you know, in our hometown, you know, we're, we're from Queens. Robin might be coming to you from uh, Florida, but, you know, she's a city girl. You know, you can take the girl out of the city. <laughs> okay. But um, but we feel that it's important to start there. Um, after New York, we're actually going to Bologna to show the film at uh, Il Cinema Ritrovato Festival, which is a, a world, you know, a world renowned um, festival. It's been going on for 35 years, I believe. And um, it's for film restoration. So it's not a porn festival. For sure. It's for people that um, are very interested in cinema, cinema history and preserving great films and important films. And they were very excited and very welcoming to uh, bring us to, um, to Bologna. You know, following that, um, we're, you know, this isn't, you know, confirmed, but there's interest in um, us going to Lisbon 
for a festival there and present the film. Um, they're doing a thing where they're honoring this old theater and they want to show films that were showing there back 50 years ago. And Deep Throat showed at this you know, historic <laughs> uh, theater in Lisbon. And so we want to bring it there. And also it bears noting that, um, that the restoration that we've done, we're working with Cineric and they have a facility in Lisbon. And so that's where the film was actually restored. So I think it would mean a lot for us to bring it back to Lisbon and show it there and you know, give us an opportunity to meet some of the people that work at the Lisbon office and, and so forth. Um, then you know, we have um, a number of dates booked. We're still actively booking or you know, looking to book some cities that we would really love to take the film because we know there's an audience for it. Um, but we will be going to uh, Seattle and um, that uh, will kick off a West Coast tour. But we have a couple of nights uh, in uh, Seattle at the Northwest Film Forum. Um, we're going to be in uh, Montreal at uh, the Cinema L'Amour which, um, you know, as far as I've read, is the most elegant porn theater in the world. And as far as Robin and I have found, it might be the only porn theater in North America. I mean, there's certainly, you know, none that we know of in America that just show strictly adult films. And so, you know, we're proud to bring the film there. We'll be going to uh, Berlin for a porn film festival Berlin and show it there, um, followed by a week run at uh, Movimento Kino. Um, a theater there in, in Berlin. Um, and uh, am I leaving anything out? I mean, there's, we're adding- Well, we have, the entire, we have the entire West Coast in the state of California. And right now our fans are clamoring um, <laughs> because we are in the process of strategizing so we can really maximize our time on the West Coast. Mm. So we would just encourage people to go back to damianofilms.com and check you know, on, on a weekly basis to see as we start filling in those West Coast dates. And, you know, we're doing this, uh, the one in New York on June 10th, 12th, as it um, is exactly 50 years to the day. And so we, we're trying to be real purists in this sense and, and, and select venues and dates that correspond with the historical aspects of the film. And so uh, uh, the West Coast, we've got some debate on the dates that Deep Throat originally premiered there. And so what we're trying to do is kind of just build a really nice um, fluid tour so that uh, we can hit all the big cities and so that everyone come out and see it. Fantastic. I mean, just just as an aside, I've actually been to Cinema Lamore in Montreal. You'll be happy. It's a, it's actually a pretty good screen. So. Uh, great. Well, that's encouraging, but we don't we don't doubt it. You know, we've had some um, some conferences with those folks. They're very enthusiastic. We love their mission and what they're doing, and so we're excited to go there. Well, and yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, mean, I think they want to um, uh, put together like a two day special event uh, around the screening of the film because they're very excited about it too. Fantastic. Now, I mean, just to start putting a bow on this, I mean, I love that you mentioned just about giving the film context for new audiences because, I mean, Deep Throat and Pornhub are two very, very, very different things for <laughs> obvious reasons. Very. But, I mean, I'm kind of curious, uh, and I want all your answers on this, but, I mean, we'll start with you, Krista. Just at the end of the day, what is the legacy of Deep Throat? Well, for one thing, the, the legacy is that it really opened the door and opened the, the dialogue about the women's empowerment. I think that was, you know, the first and foremost, people didn't really think about, you know, women being pleasured. So I think that's what made it so popular to begin with. And then again, um, you know, because then it was banned in so many places that, again, gave precedence that pe more people wanted to see it, you know, because they were told that they couldn't see something. So then they wanted to. And then the fact that, um, as Gerard mentioned, it became that women were actually going to the theater and this opened up. It was OK for them to talk about sex and be involved in sex and, you know, show interest because before, you know, women were just barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen, you know, <laughs> right. they weren't, you know, sex wasn't about them. It was something that, you know, well, they had a part in it, but it, it was, was a service they performed. <laughs> Absolutely. It was like making dinner or something like that. So after, you know, deep throat, you know, the dialogue about women's empowerment and, you know, women's sexuality really brought it to the forefront. Um, so I think that's part of the legacy that, you know, we wanted to show that it, it was, it made sex inclusive 
for women. And that was something that, you know, for the first time people were talking about that. Absolutely. And, and for me, I'll say, you know, my mother uh, made her first adult film in 1975, the opening of Misty Beethoven. She was 35 years old when she uh, first starred in that film, a time when most porn stars would have been thinking of retiring. But really, it was the beginning of the adult film industry. Uh, it, before Deep Throat, as Gerard will tell you, it was mostly underground stag films and things that really had no plot, no production value, no crew. It was all very perfunctory and it was geared towards the man's pleasure. And so now we've got this whole genre, this burgeoning industry of, of full length feature films shot on 35 millimeter that happened to also have sex in them. Uh, and so what it did was it created not only the adult film industry as, as it was called during the golden age of erotica, but it also ushered in porno chic where, you know, there were red carpets and limousines and, and, you know, Frank Sinatra had a copy of it that he kept it for, you know, in his basement and, you know, Jackie Onassis, uh, you know, at the time, Jackie Kennedy, right. um, what, you know, was known to have gone to the theater. Uh, it was, it became, it became a, an event that, that uh, the uh, Hollywood industry took notice of, uh, it was not shunned, it, you know, as Gerard will tell you, like, if you didn't go see Deep Throat, you weren't cool back then. It was like, <laughs> that was the hip thing to do. So it really, you know, it, it in the moment, people saw how it was making a difference in the culture. It's not something that we're looking at in retrospect and saying, oh, wow, yeah, the, you know, that changed things. Like, it it, it was before our, before our eyes. And you, Jared? Um, well... I would say this is that Deep Throat, you know, transcended film in that the dialogue we're having and the talkbacks that we are sure to be having are not criticism of the film itself. It's really about the impact and the effect that it had beyond that, whether it be um, how laws were changed or interpreted, how people received and enjoyed or banned or protested the film and, and so forth. Um, so I wouldn't even venture a guess on what is the legacy of Deep Throat. Um, our mission is to preserve the film and keep it so that people can see it in the way that it was originally intended to be seen, you know, in the, in the I will call it the director's cut. So the way our father had intended this film to be seen. Of course, if he could recut it now, he would do it different. <laughs> he would cut a lot of those scenes down shorter, I'll tell you that. But we're going to keep it the way he had it. And then let people decide, you know, it's out of our hands to really say, what is the legacy of Deep Throat? But we're hoping that if we can put it back out there, we'll learn what the legacy, if it's still relevant today or, you know, 50 years from now. Well, I think it is. And I mean, I, I think you guys are doing fantastic work because I mean, cinema deserves to be preserved and cinema deserves to be seen the way it was intended to be seen. And it, this serves to me as a reminder of just the importance of, of, preserving these stories but just sort of the reminder and the acceptance of uh human sexuality because i mean i always laugh when i see people protest and la you know and demonize it and shoot it down but at the same time we're dealing with something that turned into a multi-billion dollar industry so we can deny that we're not watching it but guess what we're all <laughs> watching it, so. <laughs> and that's just the, that's just the reality but i mean i you know gerard christar robin thank you so much for the time today and i mean again keep okay. up the good work and congratulations on on, on keeping the spirit of this film alive well, thank, thank you, you David. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. And look out for a Gerard Damiano senior retrospective because our plan is to take a handful of um, uh, Gerard's father's most critically acclaimed films and restore them and take those across the country as well. I love it. I can't wait. All right. But again, thank you everyone for the time today. This was an absolute delight. Thanks. Thank you, thank David. You. Pleasure meeting you. 
And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs. <laughs> 